back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the program. We're covering a lot of different stories. In the meantime, right now, we have a special discussion about Jason Van Dyke. We were recapping the sentencing earlier today. As we talked about, he was sentenced to 81 months in prison. That's six years and nine months. And now we have a special guest to talk a little bit more about this verdict. Jason Van Dyke's attorney, Dan Herbert, is with us here on Law and Crime. Mr. Herbert, welcome back to Law and Crime. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start off from the verdict. What's your reaction? We're, we're pleased with the, uh, with the sentence, um, with the verdict. We're still disappointed with that. Um, we're, we're relieved that it was not first-degree murder, but um, we believe that the evidence uh, did not, the state failed to prove its case for, um, for any of the charges in this case. But we're happy with the sentence. And I, I think I read reading that you said Jason Van Dyke, your client, is, feels relieved when the sentence came down, and you hadn't seen that from him since this whole saga began. He did, and, uh, you know, certainly him uh, reporting to a penitentiary and, uh, and spending the next two and a half plus years there uh, as a former police officer and as notorious as he is in this case, um, certainly that's not something to be happy about. Um, but it, it shows the level of despair and the um, somewhat feeling of hopelessness that he felt throughout this case, especially after the verdict that came down. Um, it, it, he believed that the evidence uh, was coming in well for him, and it was devastating for him. So for him to have the uh, have hope now where he, he knows that he's going to be able to see his kids and his wife in the very near future, and have some type of a future, albeit certainly not one um, that any of us would sign up for. Um, that fact alone, knowing that he's going to be allowed to see his loved ones again and be a part of their lives, um, was, was just overwhelming for him. But in light of what the sentence could have been, I mean, the prosecution was asking for 18 to 20 years, uh, almost seven years in prison, with the possibility of being released uh, in three. Is this what you ultimately wanted, or did you realistically believe that probation could have been an option? No. After the verdict uh, came down, um, certainly we, we have acknowledged um, since that day that uh, the appropriate sentence um, sh had to be on the second-degree murder as opposed to the aggravated battery. Um, so we were pleased to hear the judge's initial ruling began with uh, on, on what charge the sentence would be would be um, put towards, and we were happy to hear it was second-degree murder, of course, um, but we didn't know what the penalty was going to be. We, we, we asked for probation. The Illinois legislature has recognized that probation um, can be an appropriate sentence in a second-degree murder case. Uh, we never, ever expected that he would receive probation in this case. Now, Mr. Herbert, you can't be surprised by the reaction to this. A lot of people were watching. Uh, a lot of people who were uh, supporting Laquan McDonald and his family and felt that Jason Van Dyke deserved the maximum punishment, they've come forward and said that the sentence was too lenient. So I'm curious to those people who say that the sentence was not harsh enough, that, again, he should have faced uh, decades in prison, that uh, the idea that he could be released early uh, after a few years for murdering a 17-year-old when he can live his life and Laquan McDonald can't go on to live his life, what would you say to all those people out there? Well, I would tell them that I certainly understand their frustration. Uh, this case from the beginning has been, um, has been a very racially charged case, and, and the, uh, race, the race behind this case was um, exploited by virtually everyone uh, all of our political leaders and the media in this case. So um, it, it became a, a very hot button issue, especially for the African American community. And uh, the video certainly looked violent. So uh, certainly their leaders were calling for um, it, as much time. They essentially wanted a death sentence. And, you know, thankfully in this, in this case, you know, we filed more motions than probably any case in Illinois criminal history. And, you know, the judge had the benefit of those motions. And in there, it literally was thousands of pages 
of mitigating and some somewhat exonerating um, evidence that certainly I think had an effect uh, on the courts. So I understand the frustration, but I think right now uh, the better mess message is that um, we should be we should be teaching um, kids and uh, individuals that come in contact with the police to never ever put themselves in a position uh, where a police officer uh, becomes afraid for themselves or for somebody else. Uh, they simply need to comply uh, with the initial commands and uh, if they turn out to be unlawful commands, then there's an avenue for redress, but it has to, the message has to be um, there has to be compliance. Well, let me ask you, talking about that night, uh, as a former police officer yourself, do you think Jason Van Dyke did anything wrong that night? I'm not even talking about, you know, level of Ill illegality, but anything wrong that night in terms of him as, as an officer? Well, if you look at uh, Illinois law and if you look at the policies, which were certainly part of our defense, um, you know, per the policy and per the Illinois law regarding uh, the ability to uh, use deadly force against somebody that is fleeing a uh, forcible felony. If you read the language of those statutes, he did absolutely nothing wrong. Um, that statute, although it's still on the books, is essentially meaningless. And that's what police officers need to realize is that um, the statute that says you can use deadly force against an individual in these certain situations when they're fleeing an arrest, it has no meaning. It's not recognized by courts or juries or prosecutors. Um, so with, with that being said, uh, you know, yeah, there can be an argument, of course, made that uh, his decision to shoot and his uh, continuing shooting was um, was excessive and the decision wasn't lawful. I, I always maintained uh, from the beginning when I first saw that that the uh, you know the 16 shots were were difficult to explain and uh, and essentially we had trouble explaining that um, successfully to the jury. But you know I think it goes towards it goes towards the uh, uh, the state of mind that these police officers, especially in Chicago, um, were under. It, the police department, looking at it not outside of a, uh, a vacuum here, the, the Chicago Police Department was gutted for years. And as a, as a result, there were many results, but one of them was these police officers um, who were trying to support their families were working so much overtime that they were essentially frazzled. And, you know, by the time they would get out and meet citizens and, and come upon dangerous situations, they reacted and are, will normally react different than is if they had proper rest, proper training, uh, proper conditions. So uh, I think we need to look at a much bigger picture here and make sure these police officers, their, their mental state um, is recognized and taken care of because that, that's the biggest problem. Well, what we learned also Friday, um, or at least what was presented Friday, was a lot of testimony from different people that had encounters with Jason Van Dyke over the years. And again, people who look at this trial and say this was just evidence of him being aggressive for years and it ultimately culminated with the Laquan McDonald incident, what would you say to the people that say he shouldn't have even been on the police force? He should have been taken off years ago and maybe Laquan McDonald would still be alive. Well, the, the individuals that uh, testified in aggravation, I, I think if you look at their, their full testimony, including the, the cross-examination, uh, there was very little merit, uh, I, I think, taken by the judge uh, with respect to those aggravation witnesses. Quite frankly, uh, it, was, it was all but uh, admitted that a lot of these witnesses um, were, were there to testify against Jason Van Dyke, not necessarily because of what happened in an incident that was already investigated and determined not to be credible. Uh, they were there because it was Jason Van Dyke, uh, the known killer, and, and they wanted uh, to add their two cents in. So, I'm um, sorry, just interrupt. Do you, do you, are you saying that they were not telling the full story, that they were lying on the stand? Well, I, I think that uh, the, the court certainly found that they were, um, they were impeached quite a bit. And, and I think if you look at their testimony, um, that it was. In as far as Jason Van Dyke's you know, career on the police department, you know, a lot has been made about complaints made against him. But 
the number of complaints against this individual, it was not out of the norm for other police officers working in the same types of areas that Jason Van Dyke was. He was not a wild, aggressive, crazy cowboy type police officer. He worked in some of the roughest neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, and he was much more of a mild mannered person compared to his partners. You know, he had never once fired his weapon in all those years working those violent neighborhoods. So. And I got to ask you a final question for you. You know, his life now going to be in in prison. It's, you know, seven years, almost seven years. No, nothing easy to say right there. But the idea of there was a discussion on Friday about it's dangerous for a former officer to be in prison. So I'm curious about the efforts to try to protect him in prison. But the other question I think everybody wants to know is, is there a strong possibility he's going to get out before serving the full term? Will he get out within three years? What do you think? Yeah, in Illinois, when he was uh, when he was sentenced on the second degree murder, um, one of the biggest victories for us there was that um, he is eligible uh, to serve 50 percent of his time uh, as opposed to 85 percent of his time, which would have been mandatory under the aggravated battery convictions. So when we when the judge ruled that the that the conviction or that the sentence had to be based on second degree, that was a very, very big victory for us and, and the right decision. Um, yeah, he so we believe that he should be out and with the time that he's already served in a little over two and a half years. Um, it, it's not going to be an easy two and a half years. We, we do not know exactly as we sit here today where he is going to be sentenced. Um, we have certainly taken measures to try and protect him as mm -hmm. best as we can. We've received some uh, some handshake agreements as far as what people will do, but it right. is going to be a very dangerous situation for him. Dan Herbert, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's take a quick break on our end. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the McStay family murder trial. We'll be right back.